Good morning. Let's uh, take our hymn books, stand together, and we'll sing number 125. He keeps me singing. January 13th is a skating party for the youth. Um, invite a friend to attend. It's free admission and skate rental. The only thing you need to bring is a little bit of money for some snacks if you want those. Um, also, oh, it's for everybody. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that. So it's for everybody. Oh, boy, that'll be interesting. <laughs> Um, regarding that, though, um, during the skating party would have been the Bible study class. Um, and because of the skating party, Larry's asking if those that um, usually go on the Monday night class to watch the um, YouTube video of the class this week for just this week only. So, all right, senior breakfast, January 14th, 9 a.m. at the Fellowship Hall. And the board meeting, it was changed from last week. It's coming up this week, Thursday, 6 p.m. And Lakeside Ministry this Saturday is having a crochet class. And um, all the ladies are welcome. Please bring a friend, and that starts at 11 a.m. Also, Lakeside Ladies Ministry is doing some community missions um, January is Sanctity of Life Month, so they're collecting money for Mercy House now through January 29th. Some of the items also are that you can contribute are diapers of any size, gentle ease formula, baby wipes, and then there'll be, because we didn't have Sunday school this morning and usually the bottles are in the classrooms, there'll be youth standing at the door on the way out if you want to contribute some money toward this, and they'll put them in the baby bottles. 
and they'll buy some of these items that are important. So thank you very much for your time. The praise and worship song this morning is Here I Am to Worship. Now let's stand together as we sing. see all of you in the house of the Lord. I know you made a special effort to be here today with the conditions on the road. I trust and pray that uh, as you leave today, you'll be safe and uh, supposed to clear up a little bit. So we will have service tonight unless you're notified otherwise. I apologize for the late notice about Sunday school this morning, um, but uh, we we did as best we could. Um, If you are planning on, I just want to reiterate what Linda said, if you're planning on attending the Monday night session at 6 o'clock for the study on the names of God, I'm asking you this coming Monday, if you haven't already, view it on YouTube. It's up there, ready to go. If you just uh, put in your uh, 
on Google. If you go to Lakeside Missionary Baptist Church YouTube, it has all of our services on there, and it has the study from last Wednesday night. If you'll do that just for this Monday, and then starting the following Monday, we'll do live with you. Um, that way, if you have children, they can attend the skating party, or you can attend the skating party. Uh, it's not just for kids. It's for anybody that uh, has the courage to uh, put your foot on four wheels and try to go around the room. Uh, we enjoy going. I enjoy going, watching people, visiting with people, and uh, watching people Are fall. you going to skate? Am I going to skate? I used to skate and used to skate pretty well. The, the, uh, the most important words in that sentence are used to. <laughs> I can't even walk sometimes anymore, so I certainly not. Uh, I'm not going to take. This. What's that? Does it hurt? It doesn't hurt. Uh, let's, gotcha. Let's go, to the Lord, in prayer before we get too far out on the road here. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege, the honor, and the joy that it is to approach you. I appreciate all that you're doing, all that you've done in the life of Lakeside Church. And I pray, our Father, that we would be thankful, thankful to the extent that we would continue to serve you, to lift you up, to magnify the name of Jesus, because we realize that you've shared in your word, if we lift you up, you'll draw all men to you. And we look forward to today to the remaining songs that will be sung. I pray you bless me as I share a message from you with all of us that will encourage us and help us. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now it's not up there. Now it is, but it wasn't. So it's their fault. I can't do it if I can't see it. <laughs> All right. Philippians 4, 6. Now, that phrase, be careful for nothing, in the King James can be interpreted as don't worry about anything. So uh, one of the preachers that I was watching this morning on television was talking a lot about worry, and uh, our, our memory verse speaks to being a person of worry. Uh, you won't change anything by worrying. You really won't. You just make you and everybody else around you miserable. And... Uh, I'll leave it at that. Is there anything else I need to do before I sit down? You did good.
that bell you heard, if you're not familiar with it, is for Children's Church for kids eight and under. They can be dismissed at this time. If you would uh, join me in the 21st chapter of First Kings, when you found that, if you'll stand out of respect for God's word. First Kings chapter 21. I don't typically prefer to read a lot of verses, and I've been sitting over there toying with what I should read out of this text. Um, I think I'm going to read a little bit lengthy today, 15 verses, but I'm going to encourage you to follow me with those, and then I'm going to come back and share with you the thoughts that I believe the Lord would have us to see in this. So in the 21st chapter of 1 Kings, beginning in verse 1, And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said unto Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. He had a little temper tantrums, what that's saying. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal, and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letter saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people and set two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king. And then carry him out and stone him that he may die. And the men of the city, even the elders and the nobles, who were the inhabitants of, in his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. They proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth. In the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. 
Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. And it came to pass, when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard for Naboth the Jezreelite, uh, of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. Thank you. You can be seated. Now that's a lot of reading, I understand. Let me give this to you in a nutshell. A fellow by the name of Naboth has a beautiful vineyard. And his vineyard is very close in proximity to the palace of the most wicked king that Israel ever had and the most wicked king's wife that Israel ever had, Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab wants that vineyard. He offers to buy it. He offers to trade for it. And Naboth tells him no on both occasions. Because Naboth is sad over that, Jezebel says to him, aren't you the king? Don't you govern everything? Don't you know that you could take anything you want? But then she says to him, I will get the vineyard for you. And so she conspires and she has two men to bring accusation against Naboth that he's blasphemed the king and that he has also blasphemed God. Because of this accusation, it's believed and Naboth is stoned to death. Jezebel then says to Ahab, the possessor of the vineyard is dead, so now it belongs to you. Do with it as you will. That's basically the story. Now, I want to take that story, and as I personally believe, every story that you read about in the Scriptures, the Old Testament is full of these kinds of stories. But they're not just there for us to summarize it as I've done with you, but those stories are there for us to learn something about God, about Christ, about the Holy Spirit, about the church, about us. And so I would propose to us today that the word Jezreel, now remember Naboth was a Jezreelite. So Jezreel means God sows, S-O-W-S, as in sowing seed. And Naboth means fruits. So what I want us to kind of focus on for just a few minutes is our vineyard. Each and every one of us that has been saved has a vineyard. Our vineyard is our spiritual life. It is what God has sowed into us that allows us to honor him and allows us to work for him. So if, if you could, for a moment today, think about your vineyard, what God has sowed into you, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God is investing in your life. The Holy Spirit, at the moment of salvation, comes to live within you and I. And he begins a work of grace in our lives that helps us to understand more about who God is and also about what God desires from us. And so the Holy Spirit begins to work within spiritual gifts. And I don't want to get too far into that, but spiritual gifts are an enablement that the Spirit of God gives to every believer to edify the body of Christ. So for those of you that have chosen Lakeside as your church home, the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation gave you at least one spiritual gift. Now those spiritual gifts can be found in 1 Corinthians 12, I believe it is, 
Ephesians chapter 4 and some other places. And I won't get into those specifically. But I want you to understand that you have at least one of those. And the purpose of a spiritual gift in your life and in my life is to edify, and that word edify means to lift up, to encourage other believers, especially in the local congregation. Now, I don't want to get in a scolding way here, but I want to try to help you as best I can. When someone and many people over the years have said to me, I don't want to get involved in the church. I want to come, sit in the pew, listen to the good singing, listen to the fabulous preaching, and I just want to not get involved. I just, want to, I just don't want to. Sometimes because you've had a bad experience perhaps somewhere else. Because... You, we think we have seniority and we pass that place of having responsibility. If I could find that in here, I would agree with you. But that's not to be found in the Word of God. So God says to you and I, I want you, as you band together in the church that you have chosen to have your spiritual nourishment, you see, church membership is a two-way street. It's not only what the church can do for you, but it's what you can do for the church. Amen. And so we all have this vineyard. We have this gift from God, where God, whereby he says to, to you and I, here is how I want you to serve me in this congregation. Here is how I want you to magnify and lift me up. And remember the scripture says, Jesus' words in the New Testament, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So it's not my job, nor is it your job to save people. It's our job to lift him up in our lives individually and corporately as a church. And when we do, he promises then to do the drawing to those that have yet to be saved. And I honestly believe that in 2020, I have said to you in several years in passing about people sitting here Sunday after Sunday that have not yet been saved. But I believe 2020 is the year for them. I believe that God is going to begin to work in our midst in a very, very, very powerful and special way as you and I take our vineyard and we offer it unto God and we allow God to sow into our lives and we allow God to work in us in such a way that we bear fruit. And that's what Naboth means. It means fruits. And so as we bear fruit before Almighty God, God will use that to reach to our people. So with all of that introduction in mind, our vineyard is our spiritual life. Every single one of us has a vineyard. Now, the scripture in one place tells us that Ahab was the most wicked king that Israel ever had. So I want to liken him this morning to Satan. Now, for those of you that have a tendency to think Satan is a figment of someone's imagination or he's an ideology somewhere, he is just as real as I am and as you are. And his purpose is to keep people from being saved, but once they are saved, his purpose is to rob us of our vineyard. His purpose is to keep us from serving God. His purpose is to cause our lives to be such that when those that haven't yet been saved look at us, they don't really see Jesus. They just see somebody that comes to church. But if you and I will ever catch sight of the divine purpose of God in our lives, that we are to lift up Jesus and that the Lord wants to use us in a very special way, we will begin to really rejoice and to be thankful for the vineyard that God has given to us. So our vineyard is our spiritual life. The Ahab in our life is Satan. And Jezebel, the wife of, of uh, Ahab, I'm going to liken her 
to outside influence, to the world, if you will, to the non-believer. In one place in the scriptures, it talks about her painting herself up, uh, putting on makeup. Now, I, I need to tread real lightly here. Understand that. If you need to doctor it up, it's okay. Vicki told me one time, she said, why don't you get some Grecian formula and, and put a little color back in your hair? And I'm going to tell you what I told her. What you see is what you get. I don't need to doctor it up. I'm quite satisfied with it. God gave it to me, and I'm as good looking as I can be. Now, I didn't say I was good looking. I just said I was good looking as I could be. So what you see is what you get. But now, it's okay if you want to try to fix it up a little bit. And, and oh uh, got to be real careful here. Uh, some of you men are guilty. You know, you like to spruce it up too. But be honest with me. For the most part, it's, it's you ladies, right? You want to... I don't. I said this a couple of weeks ago. I don't know. Do you still have compacts where you powder yourself up? Do you have, still have those? I see on television, they got a thing you spray all over you. It looks like a hose with a little something on the end of it. And, and man, it does a pretty good job. So for some of us, I'd get a hose. Do it all up. Get you some lipstick. Do, every, do every, what you got to do. That's what Jezebel was. And I'm saying all that, and I'm trying to be a little bit funny with you to make a, a spiritual point. The world will doctor itself up to look good on every occasion. The world will paint you a good picture. Satan will paint you a good picture. Just one example. When on television you see the commercial about drinking alcohol, and oh, it's always young people. Do you, have you ever seen us old folks in a commercial for that? <laughs> so there, there you are with young people, and they have the gusto and the zest of life, supposedly. But what you don't see is the family at home that's suffering Amen. because dad's an alcoholic. Amen. What you don't see is the man in the gutter that can't get free of the alcohol. What you don't see is all the bad stuff about it. Satan paints a real good picture, and so I want to use Jezebel as the picture that Satan in, in himself will picture for us, if you will. So with all of that said, here's my thought today. Don't lose your vineyard. Now, I personally believe that the Bible teaches once saved, always saved, called eternal salvation. And the reason, there's several reasons I believe that, but I'm going to start with that premise right now. Now, lest you say on some occasion, what about so-and-so that came to the altar 50 years ago and said they got saved and you never see them again. I think that is a profession without a possession. I just don't believe that they got saved. I believe if you truly, genuinely got saved, you'll bear fruit according to what the scripture says. And so in the midst of all of this, in the vineyard that we have, I want to, to share with you some of the things that I believe are our vineyard. First of all is salvation. Salvation is peace. Two different ways that we have peace. The first one, when we're saved, we have peace with God. There's no more trouble down in our soul as far as our eternal destiny. There's no more uh, questioning where Will I live throughout eternity? And then not only peace with God, but peace of God. After we are saved, isn't it wonderful to know that there is a gentle, calm, sweet spirit that lives down inside of us that helps us to know no matter what comes our way, no matter what our lot in life shows, no matter what situation, no matter what circumstance, no matter what happens, we have a peace of God that passes all understanding 
understanding that we can say as God's people, though the world is in turmoil around me, I have the peace of God within me. And that's a great consolation to know. So our vineyard is salvation. And then our vineyard is our fellowship with the Lord. Our constant daily fellowship with God. I had the privilege Saturday morning to meet with some men that I love and appreciate. And we talked about some things in our lives. And these men talked about men that were instrumental in their lives in a church that they used to go to that held up the blood-stained banner of Jesus and lived a life that was exemplary of Jesus Christ. And so it is that uh, we have fellowship with the Lord. That's so important. You can have uh, salvation and you can have relationship with God, but at some point in our lives, if we're not careful, we can get out of fellowship with God. Now, as I said to you earlier, I believe once saved, always saved. That's relationship. But fellowship is on a daily basis. Do I spend time with the Lord in his word? Do I spend time with him in prayer? Do I spend time with him so that I can ask for direction in my life? That, I believe, is a part of our vineyard. And then there's fellowship with other Christians. And sometimes I joke with you about our definition of fellowship is to go down this long hallway and find something to eat in the other end of the building. And that's a part of fellowship. But fellowship with other believers is much more than that. Fellowship with other believers is uh, spending time together, having a meal together, getting a pizza together, uh, going to see something that, that might uplift you together, being together outside of these walls. And then when times occur in our lives where we tend to be down and discouraged, we've got somebody that we can count on, that we can go to, that we can talk with, that we can uh, know that loves us and will encourage us and help us and give us good counsel. I'm glad to know that many of you fall into that category one with another because we love one another. You can't love somebody if you don't spend time with them. And if you spend time with them, you'll end up loving them. That's the way it is with the Lord and that's the way it is with one another. Amen. Spending time together. I, I encourage you on several occasions, take somebody to dinner. You say, I can't afford it. Then have them take you to dinner. <laughs> Invite yourself. Or just say, what, what do they call that? Going Dutch? Is that what they call it? You pay, we'll pay. But let's get together. Let's go get a bologna sandwich. Let's go do something. Let's... Get to know one another just a little bit better. And, and, and if, if my mind doesn't change, sometime this year, and, and, and you see if this is not true, when you go down that hall and you go to the fellowship hall, who do you sit with? You sit with family. You sit with the people that you're closest to. We're going to have a day that we're going to go down that hallway, and I'm not going to tell you ahead of time, but we're going to go down that hallway, and you're not going to be allowed to sit with somebody you know. Or know well. I want you to sit with somebody you don't know well and get to know them. Right? Yeah. Sure. You sit down with somebody. Have you ever seen them people that are dating? And the lady sits here, and, and there's a whole bunch of ladies, and there's a row of men. And the man comes up, usually it's the man, and he talks to the lady. And then when the bell goes off, he talks to that lady. When the bell goes off, he talks to that lady. Now, I'm not trying to, to get you to court one another, but I'm trying to get you maybe to mingle just a little bit with somebody you don't know. How many of you know your first name? All of you do, right? I never meet a stranger. Never, ever, ever. It, if they're a stranger, they're not a stranger long because I will go to them, and if nothing else, I will say, my name is Larry. I do that with, with you when you first come to church. <laughs> and some of you just look at me like a bump on a log because you don't want to tell me your name. 
because you think I'm going to come to your house and eat a steak. Why don't you bring some food? Just think about it. Just, just let me get off of all this foolishness and just try to drive this point home. Let's get to know one another so that we can rely and trust and help one another. And so our vineyard is our salvation. Peace with God, peace of God. It is fellowship with God and it's fellowship with one another. And so then contentment comes into our lives. Would you really like to be content? Let me read you what the scripture said in Philippians chapter four. Paul said, for I have learned. Contentment is a learning process. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Now that doesn't mean whether he's in Michigan or Ohio. That means in his life. Whatever's going on in my life, Paul says, I've learned to be content with that. I've learned to trust God with that. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm struck, instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Paul said, whether I'm down, whether I'm up, whether I'm in, whether I'm out, no matter what the situation, I have learned in all of that that God is in control. And if God's in control, I can be content. And then a part of our vineyard is the assurance that while we are in this life, God lives with us in the Holy Spirit. But when we leave this life as we know it, we have the assurance that we're going to heaven. That we're going to heaven. What great assurance. What great vineyard. But now I want you to think about something. That's our vineyard. And, and there's probably a dozen more things we can include in our vineyard. But here's what I want you to understand. Ahab, Satan wants our vineyard. He doesn't want us to have joy in our salvation. He doesn't want us to be in fellowship with God and one another. He doesn't want us to have contentment in our life. He doesn't want us to have assurances in our life, particularly about going to heaven. So what does he do? He would rob us of our vineyard. Now in verse 1, if you go back later and read that, you'll find that uh, the vineyard of Naboth was hard against the palace of, of uh, Ahab. That word means it was very close to it. My object here today is to say to you and I, don't get too close to sin. Be very careful the choices that you make. Be very careful of the association with other people that you, that you come in contact with. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be good to people, but I'd be very careful who I run around with. My mother used to tell me constantly, about every time I'd go out the door, be careful who you associate with because whoever you associate with, you'll end up doing what they do. And I would say, and I knew what she was saying was true. And I'd say, no, Mom, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just me. And that wasn't true because I'd already associated with them, was already doing what they were doing. You need to be very protective of your vineyard. And then... Um, Ahab said, here's what I tell you, let's do. Let's trade vineyards. You give me that one that's right next door to my palace, and I'll give you a different one. I'll swap with you. I had an uncle that uh, loved to trade knives. And in his trunk of his vehicle, he, if he opened up his trunk, there would be at least two great big knife cases in there, sometimes some piled on top of the other. And he wanted to trade knives with you. He just loved to swap. He gave my dad a knife one time. Dad's, he said, I, I want to swap knives with you. My dad said, I don't carry a knife. He said, here, you, get, you carry it now. Next time he saw him, he said, I want to swap with you. I scratched my head and thought, why don't you just keep it in the first place? Which didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But my dad found out it was a case knife, C-A-S-E, and it had a circle around the word case. It was worth some money. 
And uh, he told my uncle that. And my uncle, he was just drooling at the mouth. He wanted that knife. And dad never would give it to him. As far as I know, I've got it somewhere. So he wanted to swap with him, and he always wanted to get the better of him. If you swap with Satan, he'll get the better of you. If you relinquish your vineyard for what you think the world has got to offer and all of its pleasures, and I, I would be lying to you if I didn't tell you the world had pleasures, why even Moses on one occasion said, I'd rather suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Sin's got pleasure to it. It satisfies the flesh. So what we need to understand is we need to stay away from that and we need to stand firm in our refusal and say, not so. I'm not trading. I won't take money for it. I'm not going to allow you to have my vineyard. So how does Satan go about trying to rob us of our vineyard. So he offers us what the world has to offer. I'll trade you, I'll swap with you. But the first thing he does is he tries to bring discouragement into our life. He doesn't want you to be content. He wants you to be discouraged. Probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest tactic of Satan is to bring discouragement in the life of a believer. Because when you get discouraged... At some point in time, you'll want to give up. You remember when uh, Nehemiah came back to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem after having been in captivity for 70 years? And Nehemiah came back and all of a sudden they started working and the walls started materializing, coming up. And in verse 10 of chapter 4 of Nehemiah, a man by the name of Judah speaks up. Now, I don't know if that meant Judah as a man or Judah as, as the country. Let's use him as a man this morning. Judah speaks up, and here's what he said. The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed so that there is much rubbish so that we are not able to build the wall. Do you know what Satan tells you and I? You're not qualified. You're not able you, you don't have what it takes to really have the fortitude of being a good Christian. You can't, you can't go through life like that. You just cannot do this. You can't accomplish what you think you need in your Christian walk. And so he'll try his best to discourage us. You're not able. Listen to what Isaiah said. But they that wait upon the Lord. Many of you have said this is your favorite scripture. They shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah is saying, be patient in the Lord. Now, I'm the last person that ought to be trying to preach to you about patience. But I'm going to preach the word to you, what he says. Now, if you ask Vicki, we were going to a wedding and we were a little bit early, and I said, well, let's just go through McDonald's. I got proof now. Two lanes. We pulled up here. Nobody else in line. Waiting for that young lady's voice to say, welcome back. What can I do for you? Nothing. Car pulls up. What can I do for you? Is that right? So my thermometer is rising. That car leaves. I said, you watch. There'll be another car. Sure enough, here it come. What can I do for you? And we're sitting over here. Well, about that time, my thermometer hit the top. And I said, hey, we're here. So we placed our order. Four dollars and one cent. So we got a penny, four dollars, pulled up to the window. She said, four dollars and 24 cents. And I said, you just told me it's four dollars and a penny. Four dollars and 24 cents. So I got a quarter, gave it to her, pulled up to the next window. They handed us a bag. We started down the road. We had ordered five nuggets. What else? hamburger and a Diet Coke. 
two Diet Cokes, I guess. We got a big burger, no diet, and something else. And we're going down the road, and I'm trying to tell her it's her fault. No, I'm just kidding on that last part. You, can you imagine? You would think I'd have enough sense to never, ever, ever go to McDonald's. But I know God's working on me, so I, at least I'm giving him a shot at me. But here, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I'm as weak as weak can get, but I'm trying to help you to stay strong. <laughs> Mount up with wings as eagles. How precious that is. You know what Mother Eagle does? Those little chicks are in that big uh, nest and it's way up high. She'll push them out of the nest. And when they fall and they can't do anything, she'll swoop underneath them and pick them up with her wings and take them back and tell them one more time, get out of the nest and they'll fall again. And she swoops them up every time you and I are about to fall. The great wings of God Almighty come underneath and get a hold of us and lift us and take us higher. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Listen to what Jeremiah said, for I know thy thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. You know what that's saying? God said, I'm mindful of you. I know who you are. I don't want you to lose your vineyard because you're going to lose your joy. Romans 8, chapter uh, or verse 28 says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. If that's true, then even my McDonald experiences are working toward the good in my life that God wants to bring, but I keep being resistant to him. Here's the point. Don't be resistant to the word. Don't be resistant to what God's doing in your life. And I'm promising you, I'm either going to do better at McDonald's or I'm going to Wendy's. One or the other. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Satan is after our vineyard. He's after our joy. So, he discourages us. Then he also wants to defeat us. Does everything he possibly can. You remember Jehoshaphat back in 2 Chronicles chapter 20? Remember Jehoshaphat, the enemy's coming. Jehoshaphat gathers the people together. They proclaim a fast. And somewhere in that uh, discourse, you'll find these words. The battle is not yours, but God's. Every battle that you and I face as a child of God is not really our battle, it's his battle. And we are just the pawns in that event. And what we're to do is to learn from every situation that we find ourselves in. So Satan will bring discouragement, he'll bring defeat, and he'll bring division. One of the worst things that ever happens in the life of a church is for people to get at odds with one another. That's not good. It's not good at all. It's not good from God's standpoint. It's not good from our standpoint. It draws us away from other believers. We get hard feelings. It divides us and it conquers us. There was once a military person, I can't recall right now, but his whole idea was to divide and conquer. If you can divide the people, you can conquer the people. And so what we need to understand is the tactics of Satan and not let him do that to us. And then, death. Lie on Naboth. Tell him he blasphemed the king. Tell him he blasphemed God. Lie on him and then stone him to death. That's exactly what Satan is attempting to do when he takes our vineyard, is to bring us to death. Now, not to lose our salvation, but I don't know about you, but there, there were times before I ever started preaching, and there's times since I've been preaching, I, 
I strayed uh, not, a, not as far away as I had been before. But before I started preaching, there were times that I strayed bad. But I'm here to tell you something. It, no matter how far you stray, God's still there. No matter where you go, God's still there. God still desires to take us. But what we have a tendency to do, one of the worst things that can happen is for us to slander one another. Slander is a false statement that damages somebody else's reputation. Now, I don't know of any of that going on. That's not why I'm preaching that. But when I was a little boy watching cowboys, and the bad cowboys would be going this direction, and the good cowboys would say, rather than let us chase them, let's just go across, meet them over here, and head them off at the pass. So maybe that's why I'm preaching this right now. I'm trying to head off anything that Satan wants to do to disrupt us. As far as I know, as your pastor, we have the best unity and harmony that we've ever had in this church right now. And I'm determined, and I trust that you are, to keep it that way. Because death of fellowship with other believers leads to separation and fellowship between us and God. So what's the moral of the story as I come to conclusion? Tom, you'll come. Gary, if you'll come. What's the, what's the reason for God sending this our way? The reason is God says, you're valuable to me. Your vineyard is valuable to me. That's why God says, that's why I'm sowing into your life. That's why I'm trying to bring about the things that will accomplish my will in your life. And at the same time, bring you contentment and joy and peace. There's no greater peace to be found than that's found in the very center of the will of God. Stand with me if you would. Now, in invitation time, you're always welcome to come if you choose to. But if, even if you don't come forward this morning... Could I encourage you within your spirit today to come forward toward God, to say to him, what you have sown in my life, I value. And I don't want to lose that. I don't want Satan to bring about confusion in my life. So even if you choose not to physically come forward to say that, Maybe in your spirit, you'll choose to say that. God, what you're putting into my life is so important. It's you investing in me. And I want you to have all the glory for what you're doing. So I'm going to protect my vineyard. I'm not going to let Satan take it from me. I'm not going to cast it aside. I want my spiritual life to be protected <clears throat> in Christ Jesus. Bow your heads with me for a moment, would you please? Let's do invitation a little differently this morning. Not asking you to leave your seat and come forward. But as Tom just quietly plays, not even singing a song, just quietly playing, and your head and your heart is bowed before God could I ask you for a moment to search your heart and for a moment just say God remind me of what's in my vineyard that's important to you just remind me where you brought me from where I am today God just remind me of all of the blessings that you've sent into my life. And now having done so, could I just encourage you quietly, silently, making no recognition to me, but just between you and God, God, I'm going to protect that I want that to be my vineyard 
And my promise to you that what you're sowing into my life, I'm open to that. And I want you to be all that you desire to be in my life so that I can be all that you desire me to be. Would you take a moment to do that? By doing this, if you've truly done this, you can put God's protective hedge around your life and allow Him to receive glory and honor in what you choose to do. All of us have different things in our lives, and everything that God allows, He allows it to perfect us, to help us be better children of God. I've enjoyed sharing with you this morning. I encourage you to be safe on your way home. Five o'clock tonight is our evening service. We're still in Revelation chapter 21. We're going to look tonight at the temple because Revelation 21 talks about the Lord himself being the temple in heaven. We're going to look at that tonight for a few minutes and then choir practice after that. Pray for one another. Could I ask you to do this? Just came to me. Just everybody, just look around the congregation and ask God, God, bring my attention to somebody. Put somebody on my heart. I may not even know their name, but put somebody on my heart that I can pray for as I leave here today. If you'll do that, I guarantee you there's a blessing in that. I appreciate you being here. Love you. Dave, would you dismiss us in prayer?